it is a real pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker today. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci has been the director of NIAD for 30 years now in November, I believe was the anniversary of last year. And in that time, I think it's notable to point out that not only has he directed a very vibrant and productive research program as uh, indicated by his over 1,200 publications uh, in HIV and the development of novel immunotherapeutics, but he's really become a national and global leader in identification, containment, and eradication of infectious disease. And has really been a, not only a wonderful voice for NIH and NIAN, but our country around the world. Uh, he's also a key advisor to the White House, unsurprisingly, on HIV, AIDS, and the initiatives to increase preparedness of emerging infectious diseases. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of Science, the Mary Woodward Lasker Award and the Robert Koch Award. And I think especially apropos for today that in addition to his important roles in, in advising and contributing to the scientific community, uh, Dr. Fauci had a firsthand uh, role in the, the care and treatment of the intensive care nurse Nina Pham who was exposed when treating Thomas Duncan uh, who came to the U.S. with Ebola. And because of that, I think his perspective uh, is even more unique and important. So will you all please help me in, in extending a warm welcome to, to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Katie. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning to talk uh, a bit about the ongoing Ebola outbreak of this past year, which I've entitled my talk, The Perfect Storm, and I, I think you, it'll become apparent to you uh, really quickly why I consider this a perfect storm of the factors that went into the unprecedented outbreak in West Africa, which has impacted us here in the United States and given us a taste of how one responds, uh, interestingly, to the threat uh, of an outbreak, even though we were fortunate enough for reasons that I'll get into in a moment to not have an outbreak at all, but to have a taste of what it's like to have Ebola in our country. I'd like to break my talk up uh, into four components, a little bit background on Ebola, and I know this audience is very likely, uh, the majority of you are quite sophisticated in that, but I'll quickly go over it. Uh, the current status in the West African countries, our experience with Ebola in the United States, and then very briefly to introduce the issue of diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, but you'll hear in much more detail about the vaccine arena when Nancy steps up to the podium. So let's take a, a quick look at Ebola background. Again, this audience is very familiar. It's a filovirus, family vi uh, virus, uh, several species. The one that we're dealing with currently is the Zaire species. The numbers next to the individual ones are the reported mortalities prior to the current outbreak in West Africa. It's very interesting when you look at those mortalities, they seem just completely over the top. The experience that we've had now is the direct relationship between survivability and the ability to do some rather simple, if you're in a place where you can deliver it, care in the replenishment of fluids and electrolytes, which has a major, major impact uh, on mortality and uh, morbidity, and we'll get back to that in a moment. The lower right-hand part of the slide is that very, I call it, ugly appearance of uh, the Ebola virus, which is, uh, you know, as you know, a filovirus because it, it has filaments, as you could see, not that nice, neat, symmetrical viral particle that we're all used to seeing. And this is not what it looks like. It's almost that nature has given us a taste of what an ugly virus this is, not only in reality, but metaphorically. The transmission cycle, we know a lot about it within and among humans, although we know that it is in nature and fruit bats, which likely infect non-human primates and other large animals, the precise nature of the enzootic cycle within the animal world is not completely understood but when it jumps from a animal, be it a bat or a, a bush meat eaten or touched 
animal like a chimpanzee or one of the great apes, uh, once it gets into the human population, we know really quite well now with experience over multiple outbreaks, but also the intensive experience which people have had over the current outbreak of over 20,000 infections in West Africa, and that is something we keep repeating, which caused a considerable amount of concern in the United States. It's direct contact with body fluids, that all-encompassing terminology, which really means vomit, blood, diarrhea, and other bodily fluids of a very sick person. Objects, fomites, BA material, even personal protective equipment, if not taken off properly or if just taken off properly, but accidents occur, as well as contact with infected animals, which is very likely the index point case that started this all in Guinea with the young boy who likely came into contact with an infected fruit bat, and from there we had the outbreak that we are still currently experiencing. The typical course of viral disease uh, in Ebola is extremely important for the epidemiology and public health issues. I'm sure many in the audience recall the debate that we had here in the United States about whether a person is in fact infective and capable of transmitting the virus at certain stages of their clinical course. And the more clinical experience we gather, the more certain we are about what can and cannot occur with regard to transmission. Very briefly on this slide, it summarizes now a number of papers that have been reported, several from the current outbreak. When you get exposed in incubation period of a mean of about eight to 10 days, it really clusters very concentrated on eight to 10 days, even though the range is two to 20, 21 days. The fact is the overwhelming majority occur eight to 10 days later. You have a few days, one to three, of flu-like symptoms when a person is not vomiting, not bleeding, not having diarrhea, but nonetheless is not feeling well. There's no evidence at that point, as I'll get to, that the virus can be transmitted then, but once you get at around day four to seven, vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, the death is usually through organ system failure, almost always, not always, but almost always related to the hypovolemic shock and the inability to adequately, adequately replace fluids from diarrhea and from vomiting at the same time as you have considerable electrolyte abnormalities which contribute in some respects to some of the acute complications of cardiac arrhythmias. And then either the person recovers or dies. So with that as a quick thumbnail background, let's take a look at the current outbreak in West Africa. It started at the end of 2013 in December in Guinea. At least that's how the epidemiologists trace it. From there, a young boy got infected, infected likely through family members and funerals, a group of individuals which then spread from Guinea to the neighboring countries. And I know probably this audience of microbiology, infectious disease people, uh, appreciate the geography of West Africa, but for those who don't, it's very interesting how the country of Guinea wraps itself around Sierra Leone and Liberia. So when you talk about cluster of countries together with borders near each other, it's very different from an isolated outbreak in Zaire or in Kikwik or one of the places among the many outbreaks that we had where it was relatively easy, nothing is easy, but relatively easy to do the isolation, contact tracing, et cetera. Not so easy when you have the factors that I'll get to in a moment. So if you look at the evolving epidemiology, this is from March. So we went from December under the radar screen until around March when all of a sudden it became quite clear that we were dealing with an outbreak that involved more than one country's. So these next several slides that I'm gonna show give you red, which is the location of cases, and then in the right-hand part of the slide, the total cases in the three countries involved, at least as reported, and likely some under-reporting, both of cases and debt. So this is March 2014. This is May 
2014. July, as you can see, the spread throughout the three countries and the cumulative cases on the right. September, and then things really started to explode around October of 2014 with Liberia leading the pack, but not for long because there were waves of cases in the different countries. We got to November, again, almost complete blanketing of the three countries, December 2014, January 2015, with now Sierra Leone overtaking in total cases Liberia, and now in the current month of February of 2015, we have 22,000 cases and 9,000 deaths. Now, that's when look, one looks at the cumulative cases, but what we now look at the comparison of the 24 outbreaks that have occurred since first recognized in 1976, almost simultaneously in Zaire, former Zaire, current Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Sudan, there were outbreaks ranging from a few cases to the last largest one was in Uganda in 2000 of about three to 400 cases. Now, with the 22,000 plus cases, we have the largest outbreak by several fold more than all of the other outbreaks combined. So when you talk about the historic nature of this outbreak, it is truly unprecedented in its magnitude and in its duration now, because it's been over a year that we've seen this. And this is really unprecedented when you think of prior outbreaks. If you look at the number of infections, so this is a different plot. This is infections per week starting with January on the left, February, March, April. If you look at Liberia in blue, peaks up, comes down, Sierra Leone following, and then Guinea kind of smoldering along. The thing that's troubling is that although we're very gratified that by a number of factors which I'll get into, we've had a dramatic diminution in cases in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and to a lesser extent in Guinea, if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, the little, two little upticks that you see in Guinea and Sierra Leone, it doesn't show with Liberia, but we've had last week another cluster of an outbreak in Liberia. This is one of those true statements that Yogi Berra is really right. It ain't over till it's over. And when you're dealing with Ebola, this is one of the problems we have that we're going to get to in a minute. You don't put the outbreak out until the last case is gone. So I entitled my talk, The Perfect Storm. So what are the factors that facilitate it? Well, the perfect storm of having every wrong factor at the same time in the same place. So you have poor nations with limited health infrastructure. You have no prior experience in West Africa with Ebola. Most of it was in Uganda, Sudan, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Few health professionals with many health threats, it isn't just Ebola, it's malaria, it's a variety of other issues and problems. When you say few health professionals, that's the understatement of the year. Take Liberia, where there's one physician per 70,000 people. Now, for those of you who live in Washington, D.C., not too far from here, there's a street called K Street, K Street and 19th where there are like maybe 500 doctors in a single building. And I just couldn't help but realize that there are probably more doctors on K Street than in all of West Africa. And that's just one street in one city in the United States. That's the perfect storm. Frequent traveling across porous borders. You have relatives who are living in Guinea and working in Sierra Leone and vice versa. The governments don't particularly cooperate. They have a history of regional conflict and, and oppression. And so authority, including medical authority, is not particularly well trusted. And we've seen backlashes and, and um, actually attacking, in some respects, health workers and epidemiologists and others who were trying to help. I mean, that's just fear and panic that's associated with mistrust of authority. And then the local customs of burial, where it is part of the tradition of a beautiful thing in other circumstances of how people are very affectionate and care about the process of burying loved ones, which is the perfect 
storm of spreading infection, which we know can easily spread during the burial procedure. So how did it get turned around? How did those curves go down? A, co a combination of many things, education, hygienic practices, the ability to identify and contact trace, the proper personal protective equipment, a whole bunch of people who have volunteered to go over there as well as health workers. I actually see a couple of people I recognize in the audience who actually have gone over there and volunteered. The ability to prompt, isolate, aggressive supportive care, and very importantly, major changes in the safe burial procedures, which many people there feel have been a major factor in turning this around. You know, the United States played a role. The president got involved in the sense of bringing the military to do command, control, logistics, and engineering, putting up the Ebola treatment units, a 25-bed facility for infected health workers, as well as the ongoing CDC and USAID issues. Okay, quickly turning to Ebola in the United States. We have a tragic uh, situation of historic proportion in West Africa. When we got the taste of Ebola in the United States, I think it could best be described in the USA today, is that in the United States, certainly fear of Ebola spread much faster than Ebola itself. And for those of you who have followed this, you know what I'm talking about. What people get confused at, you need to look at Ebola in the United States in three buckets. Namely, the deliberate controlled air evacuation of people who've been identified as either an Ebola patient or a person exposed but not yet diagnosed. You do it deliberately, you do it in a controlled way, there's no problem. A lot of hullabaloo, a lot of press, a lot of people seeing others getting off planes, but that's not an outbreak. The next is the very, very rare, N equals one non-medical person and one medical person who inadvertently comes to the United States infected in West Africa, but does not know they're infected until they get here. And that was Thomas Duncan, the Liberian traveler who went to Dallas, and Craig Spencer, the physician for MSF, who came to New York City. And then there's the other, the unusual situation, but it's entirely understandable, the two nurses who took care of Duncan in Dallas, Nancy Pham and Amber Vinson. So very quickly, the first case of Ebola in the United States is a very interesting epidemiological pattern with many lessons learned. So on September the 19th, Thomas Duncan departed Monrovia and did what we all do when we go for West Africa, landed in Brussels, went from Brussels to the United States, got on the plane, no symptoms at all, no fever, nothing. Arrived in Dallas on the 20th, went four days in Dallas in the community with no symptoms. Now remember when we were talking about how it can be spread is only during the obvious symptomatic period. That caused a lot of panic in the United States who this person may have been infected. Went to the ER on the 24th, on the 26th, because then he had two days of symptoms. Misdiagnosis, came back a couple of days later by ambulance, very sick, entered the hospital. Nurses took care of him at first with not the classical personal protective equipment, and only two days later switched over to the full personal protective equipment. We don't know when Amber and when Nina got infected, but almost certainly it was during those days when they were not fully protected, though you can't definitively prove that. However, what happened then is that we had our first two infections in this country with Nina and with Amber, and we at the, United, at, at the NIH are one of three hospitals that have been pre-prepared to take care of people in which you need proper isolation, and that is the NIH, Emory, and Nebraska. So we were one of the three, so we took care of Nancy and I had, uh, Nina, and I had the opportunity to take care of her in our clinical center. Those of you not familiar, that's the clinical center on the lower right and the three centers that are designated, and believe it or not, that's me getting ready to go into the room to see Nina, who when she came in was obviously still infected, still dehydrated, but she did very well. She was actually not, she was quite well taken care of in Texas, even though they transferred her to us. But we had a team, and the reason 
we do this that we just practice intermittently, almost like a drill uh, um, we do on a weekly to monthly basis. This is Nina getting discharged from the hospital at NIH up in Bethesda, and on the right-hand side is our nursing staff. The reason I show these pictures is that there is a major, major difference, not in the talent of the physicians and the nurses, but in the facilities, that if you can get somebody in, put a PICC line in, monitor their intravenous, monitor their potassium. I mean, we did more potassium determinations on one patient than they probably did on a whole ward in West Africa to make sure that she was in correct balance. And she did very well and is doing well now. I continue to follow her on a weekly basis. However, then came the panic. So how do you stop people from coming into America who might be infected? Remember, one person came in. So there was this big issue of banning travel. We argued very strongly that the best way to keep Ebola out of the United States is to suppress Ebola in West Africa. And you don't do that by isolating the country. So there was exit screening and entry screening. So first we started with exit screening. You can't get out of West Africa without having a fever, determination of symptoms, determination if you have contact. If you have any of that, you can't get out of the country. If you get on the plane and then have entry screening at the five airports, same questioning, same examination. The important thing is on the now, I think, nine or ten times that I had to con testify before Congress to alleviate their fears about many people coming into the country from West Africa. In all of these screenings, there wasn't a single person who was stopped who had Ebola. I mean, there were a lot of febrile people who tried to get in. Almost all of them had malaria. They didn't have Ebola. So the idea that there are many, many, many people with Ebola trying to get into the United States, when you look at the screening of thousands of them, that just didn't happen. However, what could happen is that you have a healthcare worker. And in this case, Craig Spencer, who you know, was infected in West Africa, came here, was fatigued but not quite symptom, and then became the most famous bowler in Brooklyn when he got on a metro and decided he wanted to go to a restaurant and go bowling. But when he woke up the next morning and felt sick and had a fever, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He contacted MSF, he was admitted to Bellevue, taken care of properly, and he did well. However, that triggered a whole series of medical political events that demanded the quarantining of medical workers, which I spent a considerable part of a few weeks of my life trying to convince people that quarantining all of our medical people who come back would quickly run out of medical people who would be taking care of individuals. And so what was happened is that there was a stratification. So we had a balance not only the rights of healthcare workers, but the unintended consequence of getting a person to be out of action for 21 days upon coming back. So a matrix of the degree of your risk was matched against how you were monitored, either take your own temperature or have somebody else take your temperature, and whether or not you're restricted. So rather than go through all of this, it was a reasonable thing. If you're a high risk, you have a needle stick or a slash, you have direct active monitoring, but you don't travel for 21 days. If you have some risk, then you get a case-by-case -case determination. If you had a low risk, like I was considered low risk, because although I took care of a patient, I did it under such good conditions that I was low but not zero. So I had to take my temperature every day. Someone else took it. And I had to report it, but I could get on the metro. So I was allowed to go on the metro. Whereas if I was a high risk, I would not. And then if you have no risk, that's not it. So let me close up very briefly introduction, and then we'll hand it over to Nancy, who will tell you a little bit more detail about it. In the area of the research that's ongoing in diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, we'll skip diagnostics for a minute and just quickly go to what you're likely hearing about and reading about is multiple vaccine candidates that were developed, one of which was developed by Nancy at the, uh, at the NIH and now in collaboration with GlaxoSmithKline. Another product, which is a VSV vector expressing a Ebola glycoprotein gene, and another 
that's a little bit behind in the queue, a Johnson & Johnson prime boost with an ad vector followed by an MVA boost. On February the 2nd, the first injections went into people in Liberia. My deputy, Cliff Lane, has been there now six times for the organizing the trial. They now have several people on the randomized control trial. Now, obviously, with not a lot of infections going on, we're still going to go ahead with the trial to determine maybe efficacy, but if not, at least safety and immunogenicity. A number of drugs are being tested. Uh, be careful what you read in the paper about favorable results. They are all done so far on non-controlled trials. So as those who've been there know, you could have a village in which you're taking care of individuals with a mortality of 30%, and then the next month, it can go down to 15% only because you're taking better care of the patients. So finally, looking ahead, let's focus on what the problem is. West Africa, the problem is not in the United States. We need to prepare for future outbreaks, and we need to move towards eliminating the ex to the extent possible. This is not going to be easy. The health care disparities, which is the reason why you have an outbreak in West Africa and you don't have an outbreak in the United States. And as Jim Kim said in a New York Times article not too long ago, be careful of that little uptick because, as he said very clearly, and I couldn't say it better, we've underestimated Ebola in the past, and it's possible even now as everything is going down, we might do it again. So we can't forget that we have only one goal, zero cases. You know, and as Yogi says, it's not over until it's over. Thank you.